Hi everyone. Today um, I'm going to bring to you a, an after action report um, about scenario ASL G, uh, scenario J34 Men of the Mountains. Um, so th this uh, event uh, takes place in Montenegro in Saint Saint Jean, Montenegro. I know I massacred that um, um, that uh, name of the poor area of the gorgeous part of the world, but hey. And it took place on the 13th of July, 1941. So essentially what you have here is uh, most, if not all, of the uh, um, Balkans are occupied by the Axis forces. I'm, I'm sure this is a, a scenic uh, village in Montenegro, and the Italians uh, are occupying it. So it's elements of the uh, 14th uh, Corps, Italian 9th Army, and with an ELR of two versus Montenegrin partisans with an ELR of five. And essentially the victory conditions of um, the scenario is to uh, essentially take over and possess a gun or be the sole occupying, uh, occupier of the hex containing the gun. And um, the other thing that's interesting is that eventually uh, the Italians will be uh, attack from two sides, from the north and from the south, um, by the partisans. And um, initially, the Italian armored fighting vehicle has to start up abandoned and uh, unpossessed uh, for the ar artillery. which is pretty interesting. I was just looking, uh, glancing over the uh, SSRs and the, uh, it's, uh, it's a game with at least four uh, special rules. I'm not going to go over them in, in detail. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one thing though, what attracted me to this scenario was the fact that uh, the fellow that designed it, Mark uh, Bretherton, and I could be wrong that this is not the designer. Uh, I believe he wrote a blog uh, on the net explaining why he abandoned uh, Advanced Squad Leader. Now, I don't really want to directly uh, address that. Um, I thought about doing a video uh, with respect to uh, challenging some of the points that he made on his blog and also addressing a Vice article that was written about uh, Advanced Squad Leader. But um, I, I really uh, don't want to go into that that much detail, but I'll, I'll mention a couple of points uh, uh, as I do the AR and indirectly address that. Uh, so with respect to the Vice article, uh, the crux of that article and uh, was that uh, uh, squad leader kind of romanticizes the German side of the, uh, the Axis side of events. Um, however, as you can see here, in this particular example alone, uh, in this scenario alone, you have an Axis OB um, and you have an Allied OB and right off the bat, the Allies have an ELR of 5, but the Italian Army only has a, uh, an ELR of 2. So that isn't, in my opinion, a romanticizing the Axis. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's quite the opposite because um, what ELR stands for is that if the Italian player does not stand up to any morale checks, his OB will uh, will downgrade substantially quicker than the Allies. And the second item that uh, points to the fact that it, we're not taking the side of the Axis here is that um, here it's a scenario where the Italians were taken completely by surprise. There was an initial defeat but we also mentioned the the um, the consequences where over fifteen thousand Montenegrins were were killed, uh, and saw their sparsely populate, uh, populated villages lose another ten thousand to forced labor camps. So at the same time, we are pointing out uh, uh, Axis atrocities. So I, I don't see this game romanticizing the Axis. Uh, at all. In fact, uh, what it does, it, it reveals some 
interesting thing facts of of history that um, are sometimes nothing more than a footnote or sometimes less than a footnote in real history books in big history books so um that's what attracted me to the scenario but i'd like to mention that i purchased this scenario through the uh, war gamers vault in part because it was contained in uh, asl journal number two and what really uh, enticed me to uh, asl journal number two was uh, the capture of Balta, which is a COI scenario redone by Jim Stoller in, uh, using the ASL rules. Now, that is interesting. Here it is. Capture of Balta, J29, scenario adaptation, Jim Stoller. Now, I can tell you for a fact that 10 out of 10 of Jim Stoller's um, uh, readaptations are remarkably good scenarios. Classics end to end, whether you play them in <laughs> classic or or uh, in uh, using the ASL uh, rulebook, and by using the ASL rulebook, you you really have a lot more enjoyment and a lot more twists and turns to the outcome. Yeah, so that's that, and this is this is a scenario that's really well balanced, and uh, it um, it um, it's never the same scenario twice. Now, going back to the uh, our after action report, that was a bit of a tangent, but we took care of the vice article, I think, in more ways than not. But, um, but uh, I, I shout out to uh, David Garvin. He wrote an interesting um, article about that in No Dice, No Glor Glory, and uh, a well uh, written rebuttal with more facts than fiction. Yep, so in the Italian OB, we have a 75 star weapon. We have a tankette, which is really small and very hard to hit. And uh, eight first line squads and four leaders, which is a remarkably uh, good leader to uh, multi man counter ratio for the Axis forces. And for the Montenegrin partisans, we have two uh, first line units and nine uh, regular partisan units to two leaders. Actually, three, uh, if you count the reinforcements, and uh, a total of 12, uh, 14 MMCs with the reinforcements that come in on turn three. So basically, what I'd like to do here uh, in terms of uh, AR is just go through the play-by-play, uh, turn-by-turn -play, uh, -turn pictures. I'm not going to do any chicken scratches or lines. And... Um, what the pictures represent is the uh, consequences at the end of each player turn. So let get, let's get started right away, show you how things look. Now, uh, we played um, each side with my opponent, Dennis um, Freiburg. Um, so we played each side and we both won as the Italians. And lately, Dennis has been on a winning streak, but we, we hope to change that. <laughs> So this is the turn, the end of the turn, turn uh, ally turn one, and basically what you have here is a very uneventful, um, uneventful uh, turn one and a, a quite a, a bit of an advance here. It, so it comes from row AA up to row W, um, with no speed bumps along the way. Um, yeah. And I believe the first speed bump is this little um, squad here. Now, I don't remember uh, offhand, but I may have put some squads here just to strip him of concealment. Uh, but as you can see, this unit here can see all these guys. And this fellow here up in steeple can see pretty much everybody that advanced. And uh, my um, my whole kit uh, in uh, Kaburo here, my whole crux of, of my defensive strategy is, of course, everybody puts a, the best leader and the best MMG and half squad up in the steeple to to uh, uh, be a, a advanced threat to the advance uh, to the attackers. Um, I picked remarkably a classic squad leader. Um, uh, classic squad leader 
defense where I put my units in the most uh, in the most uh, difficult to crack areas of the village with, where there are stone buildings. Um, and, and I don't regret doing it because basically if you spread out your forces um, too much, you will not be able to mount a, a enough firepower to thwart the advance. And then if the uh, attackers get you into close combat, you're pretty much eliminated. That was my thinking. I, I could be wrong. So that was the end of turn, ally turn one. Let's go to the end of Axis turn one. Again, quite un, un, uneventful. Uh, but what's uh, important is that uh, we have enough units uh, still to say that, okay, for turn one, we uh, uh, the the allies still have something to think about in terms of uh, advancing. Let's go to ax, uh, ally turn two. With ally turn two in play, um, it looks like uh, they overrun the first box, so the first defense here, it was a, a pretty um, good advance in part because the mortar up in the hill was ineffective at, at getting them. But he could still fire at this unit here, providing he gets a hit and providing he gets raid. And so, so far, in terms of being a speed bump, we're all right. Uh, we fared relatively well. And um, what um, what I'm always scared of when I'm playing the Italians is that these guys break the ELR and you, then your whole OB transforms into second line and conscript units, which will be sliced like butter by your opponent. So uh, again, I'm repeating myself, but I put my my forces into well defensible positions, let the allies advance. They, they, the onus is, is on them to advance and uh, try and break me. And what's interesting to note is that with partisans, they cannot fire me. So I'm not scared of three power or two, fire, two uh, up three at, attacks. Uh, what I'm scared of is uh, if they combine at close range with two, the two elite units or they go into close combat uh, against one of my units with an elite and a regular partisan unit. Uh, the other thing that is important to note about this scenario is that both my AT gun, uh, my AT gun and my tank start abandoned. Now, I placed my crew, uh, in my crew, uh, my crews, in um, in cover, in with a relatively short distance to to uh, get to their uh, uh, tank and artillery piece, so they can reoccupy the their positions and and get into the armored fighting vehicle. Now, how does that uh, uh, unit? How does that tank get uh, reoccupied? Uh, basically, I put my crew here, and then I uh, uh, move them or assault move them to the hex of the um, vehicle. He expends one entire movement phase to get in, and then, lo and behold, uh, your uh, armored fighting vehicle is reoccupied. I'm just going to quote you the rule about entry. It's in Chapter D5. What's the decimal? D5.42, entry. Okay, there are some exclusions. So now that you know the where to find the rule number, you can read it. And uh, remember this AR about how, um, how we can reoccupy uh, vehicles. It will come in handy in case your vehicle is demo the, uh, immobilized when there's a subsequent hit on the armored fighting vehicle and you don't pass your tax check, the crew has to pop out. If they survive, keep them with the armored fighting vehicle. And eventually when your movement turn comes around, you can reoccupy your, uh, your, your vehicle. But at the same token, I think you can reoccupy it with any uh, multi-man counter. It does not necessarily need to be a crew counter. So having said that, that was the end of uh, partisan turn uh, two and uh, during my phase I believe I opened up with the uh, 
I believe it's a medium machine gun here, plus the mortar, and held back this uh, this uh, a, a line of attack. Now, it was not readily ev evident to me when uh, I was playing uh, because I was concentrating on uh, getting enough firepower to to uh, sort the attack. But uh, if you step back and take a global uh, look at this map, now you can see that what my opponent was formulating was a pincer movement. So he's trying to get to, he's trying to, uh, he's not trying to get into the village. He notices here that, hey, um, uh, it will be difficult to get to, uh, get to uh, the Italians by engaging in a firefight with them. So let's advance and infiltrate this whole, uh, or bypass this whole fortification. It's a, it's a fortified village, more or less. And fortified with firepower, not with terrain. And let's get around it, bypass it, and go to the gun. That's my victory objective, which is brilliant, right? It's brilliant. All right. Uh, now the uh, partisan reinforcements come in from the rear. And now uh, I'll talk, uh, I've talked in, in length about uh, the dangers of having uh, units, enemy units in your, in your rear, is that. Um, the primary uh, uh, danger is that when our unit breaks and they need to route and there's nowhere to route because you basically encircled them, they're eliminated. And, and we're not talking about a K1 or a K2 or a K3. We're talking about KIAs. KIAs and that being all the units that are broken and can't route, failure to route ends in elimination and it's the most fundamental way and painless way of winning a game really is by uh, getting into the rear and then boop um, magic happens um, the other tactic that you can use when you have hip units instead of um, having hip units set up in order to ambush somebody uh, is to keep them hip and the, in, in an Advanced squad leader, there is no obligation to reveal them like in the classic game. In the classic game, a unit ends up uh, adjacent to you. You got to pop them up. In this game, uh, they basically have to enter your hex or do a search and mop up in order to reveal hidden units. And if your opponent you've, you've, uh, just omits to do that and advances, then that's an excellent opportunity. Uh, once you break those units to reveal that unit in the rear, they can't route. And they're gone. I shouldn't reveal my magic tricks to you, but anywho, let's uh, continue. Um, now we got something to worry about. The major threat was this uh, group, so I moved my tank there to to meet that uh, to meet that threat. Now there's a couple of things wrong with moving that, that tank in that position. Um, first and foremost, it's only its main armament is only four fire firepower fire factors on the IFT. It's a bow-mounted machine gun. It breaks down into level. So, uh, basically, the the big mistake that you can do with this tank, and I think I've done them, is advance them into close range to an MG. Number one and number two is not giving them infantry support. So. Rather than rushing to move my tank at that position there, I should have brought him up on the mountain. Uh, yeah, and, and there was no need to uh, crew expose them. Now, the other strength that you need to know about this tank uh, is that it's a very small target, two white circles, right? Two white circles, it's a plus two to hit right off the bat. And if they're in motion, that's an automatic plus four detriment to your opponents to hit dice roll. So you, you need to remember that. And if you do not correct your opponent and he only adds a plus one for a small target as opposed to plus two, he'll get a hit on you. you know? And before the MG can destroy you or attempt to destroy you with penetration factors because of close range and weak armor, they have to first score a hit on you. And if they can't, or if they break their MG trying to do so, that's going to be, uh, hurt them badly. 
So that's something to remember when playing with uh, not only uh, Italian tankettes, but early war panzers. Interesting enough. So I realized that after playing the game and doing the AR, I don't realize it in the course of, of playing. <laughs> Uh, God. So, uh, by the, uh, this is turn 4A. Yeah, okay, we're, we're good. By the end of turn 4A, they got rid of the speed bump, but these units here, most of them got licked uh, by, by the Italian MG on the steeple. Uh, they infiltrated behind uh, Piccarelli's uh, position. And they managed to, uh, with a lucky roll, I believe, uh, break a unit in the stone building here so they can occupy it. Lucky rolls will be lucky rolls. And they got into a melee situation here with the tank. And the tank has no way of defending itself because it broke its bow machine gun. And lo and behold, they are just on the footsteps of capturing the gun. And I it's at game end, so I can conceivably recapture it if it falls. <clears throat> Let's continue. Close combat phase, the tank is, is wrecked in a blaze. Is it a lucky roll? Well, his CCV value was something like, uh, let's see, five, and then a minus one for attacking an, uh, a vehicle with no usable MGs less than or equal to 15 millimeters, six. So, not much luck involved there. It's uh, a matter of skill and knowing your odds and uh, thwarting the attack. Uh, we did manage to, um, we did manage to uh, uh, break the bodacious and audacious infantry that tried to attack the artillery gun. That was luck. And uh, this fellow breaks, but he can route to, uh, and act as a reinforcement, uh, route in this direction because you can't see them and act as a reinforcement to, uh, to these guys, routing back. And again, uh, at this point in time, um, these guys are easily with the with the terrain cover afforded to them easily going to overrun this position. Uh, this position seems to be overrun, but I took back my prisoners because I, I, in close combat because that's what I, I needed to do. And I don't think they were quite lucky in close combat here. But all the positions here have been uh, done for. One lucky break and uh, a couple of advances. We're done. Uh, I believe here this was a result of infiltration. I could be wrong. Locked in melee. There's always a risk uh, about going into close combat, but uh, with three firepower factors and the inability to form fire groups as the partisan player, you should definitely consider close combat. Now, over attacks. Uh, what happened here, though, is I managed to uh, counterattack, and and then you'll see I'm going after the uh, demoralized uh, partisans, trying to stave off this attack. But um, and at this point, uh, my opponent seemed a bit despondent because there's three turns left. I managed to thwart this attack. My uh, leader here is still in good order, but what changed? Uh, the turn of events is that this MG was about to malfunction. Break down 11, guys. It happens. So now I'm upper level encircled because uh, these guys in the steeple uh, are cannot go down. Um, and a steeple, I believe, is third level according to the terrain rules in Chapter B. But uh, concurrently, he can't send up uh, more than that. I don't think he can send more than a half squad up to engage in close combat. Um, all the other units here um, are either in close combat or about to um, 
they saw two stocks of Italian infantry that are in, in good order. Now, uh, something clever that happened here is a route forward, a route back, uh, he loses his DM, and uh, I have to split my forces and try and go after these broken fellows. And this fellow here can self-rally. So, in essence, in essence, if I really wanted to um, to do a lot of damage, um, I had to move at this juncture and make sure that I uh, prevented these fellows from uh, getting back into good order and um, and uh, advancing on the gun. So conceivably, I could have abandoned the gun and used that crew to uh, just wreak havoc on them. Um, I don't think I did that. Let's see. Or attempted to, then did not uh, uh, think well enough. So this fellow looks like he's back in order, and that's uh, clear and present danger. Uh, if, if they're stacked with a leader, and I think they are, uh, look at the firepower, uh, look at the movement factors. Two, one and a half, that's three and a half. And then that's four, five and a half, six, seven and a half. So they can come really close. As for the Italian player, we continue to route towards a favorable area. Here, we've locked them up, but not for long. Uh, once he, he, once my opponent, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Dennis Freebird, uh, Devious Dennis, um, yeah, Devious Dennis. <laughs> Good name for old Dennis. Good old Dennis. Um, so once uh, my opponent saw that what was happening here, of course, what he's going to attempt to, to do is bring these two stacks up here. And um, during the course of play, what I was focused on are these two folks as immediate threats. And I overlooked this fellow and that fellow. And hindsight has vision 2020. Here you go. What did I say? What did I say? I completely forgot about that move, but here it is now. And one dude went into close combat here, and he has one for reserve. Oh. This fellow could have gone CX, or he forgot a CX counter there. Could be. Uh, so now he has another turn to make a difference. These guys try to escape and, and move away, but they got bitten. They got bitten. Now we're locked in melee, and he has a DC charge. There goes Devious Dennis. But I believe here that that leader should have been under DM'd. If we count the moves, uh, it would have been two, three and a half, four, five and a half, six, seven and a half. So that leader should have been under DM as well. And it looks like we forgot a CX counter for the leader once the CX uh, infantry moved in. Both units should have been uh, under CX. I don't think it made a difference in the role in any case, but look, uh, A.2 should have been aware of about it. And basically, um, once the close combat was uh, won, the game ends, the uh, partisans are um, in control of the gun, they win. Congratulations, Dennis. Excellent win. Um, uh, however, it did come at a great cost. And a great cost because uh, at one point or another, I remember Dennis saying, okay, you got the game. I said, I don't think so, Dennis. Now, when, when you encourage your opponent like that, um, it's a double-edged sword because you could be right. And you could be, um, you could be um, a right that... Uh, uh, your opponent is wrong about his defeat, but what if it turns out that he uh, 
opted to concede the game, and in fact, um, it was not winnable. You kind of end up looking a bit uh, devious, but um, it is a devious game. So we, we briefly spoke about Vice and how um, uh, they're wrong about that this game promotes uh, the Axis side of things. Um, and if you want more detail as to uh, that rebuttal, I would, I would suggest that you look at David Garvin's uh, um, blog in No Dice, No Glory. Now, the other uh, side note that uh, is up for discussion is why this fellow quit after designing two scenarios and being a champion at, at advanced squad leader quit. He mentioned a couple of points which I, I, I kind of find uh, uh, baseless to be completely baseless. But um, what you have to keep in mind is, is I guess, three things, um, three fundamental facts. Um, this game was made for, I guess, brainy geeks, for lack of a better term, or let's say intelligent people, all right? But it's it's not, it's not I don't think, um, uh, exclusive to intelligent people. <laughs> um, people of all intellectual strengths can play it. I guess I am proof of that, okay? I'm, I, maybe I shouldn't say that, but it's, the, it's really the truth, okay? Um, it's really the truth. And why deny anybody uh, the ability to play? I have no idea. Uh, and there is a disadvantage for, for folks that are really smart in playing this game. And that is that uh, the calculus makes sense. And if you look at how the game progresses in terms of mathematics and probability, um, you, if you are smart enough to, to, to uh, do the math, you can tell which side is going to win and you can foretell which side is going to win. And you can foretell uh, even before playing the game to a, a logical conclusion that this might not be winnable. And um, that's a disadvantage that people with intellectual strengths have. Um, and it robs them of an element of enjoyment. Um, but what the smarter player kind of discounts is the element of luck. And um, if you discount the element of luck, then the game goes south really quickly. Um, you cannot play this game solely on probabilities. You need to um, be always aware, be always conscious that, hey, those snake eyes can pop up at any given moment. What do I do if that is the case? And what if I stop the game short because I don't feel lucky enough to, to do this and succeed? Then what's going to happen? Especially at a tournament level. Uh, at the tournament level, if you discount your element of luck completely, um, you might not end up winning. So, you know, being smart in this game has both its pro pros and cons. Now, the second thing that you need to keep in mind is that um, there are people out there that tell you, you need to learn this before you play the game. And that's complete nonsense. It's a, it, a clear indicator that this person that told you this is really toxic. Keep your distance, stay away from them. Um, the only way to play, to learn how to play this game is by playing it. Um, without playing the game, you can read the rule book 10 times over. Uh, it won't materialize into anything. Uh, playing with an opponent that is your, um, your, uh, at your level or higher, um, or even lower, uh, pay it forward is important, okay? And when in doubt, look at the rule book. And if the rule book does not have an, the answer, the community does, and so do Q&As. And um, there are a lot of uh, Q&As to look into, but if, if you are pressed for time and, uh, uh, and, uh, and you want to, the, you're more interested in the flow of the game, you can agree with your opponent 
or roll, roll a die and decide. Um, contrary to um, what might be out there, um, there, there are house rules uh, that uh, people play with. Even Monopoly is played with house rules, and that rule book is not even a page long compared to Squad Leader. So there it is. The point is have fun. And the third point is that I like to make is that, hey, listen, if this game is getting too much, take a break. Taking a break is better than burning bridges and not looking back. And uh, I, I'm glad that from time to time I do take a break. And more importantly, I went from playing the game seven days a week down to four. And out of those four days, um, uh, two are, are only a one hour session each. And at times it goes as far as one, an hour and a half or an hour, hour and a quarter, but never before that. Now, this uh, video didn't come to you so early in the morning because I didn't pre-do it. I did it Saturday morning. I did two takes, not one. Um, in each case, it lasted less than half an hour. And I took care of my chores before um, before um, uh, turning to the desk and doing a video about Squad Leader. Um, you should have your priorities. So um, there's work balance, um, work balance, um, uh, that you need to worry about or take care of and there's also hobby life uh, balance as well if you're doing your your hobbies full-time and you're not paying attention to your significant other that's not good right you need to take care of your you, the people that you love whether those uh, uh, people may be your your children or your significant other or both or one or the other doesn't matter you got to take care of yourselves now unfortunately I have to conclude this video and it's I can see by the clock that it's 38 minutes long um, it's probably the shortest video uh, versus the others that I've done um, remarkably enough a three-hour videos uh, not likely but happens um, to conclude the video once again I'd like to um, thank all the viewers and uh, with, without any uh, exclusivity, there's people that supported me from the get-go. And again, uh, the amount of subscribers on my channel have, have surpassed my, my imagination that this channel could be so, so large. I feel blessed and lucky for those that are agnostic and for those that are faith, faithful, I, I, I do feel blessed and, and very fortunate to have uh, uh, an audience of this size and uh, how many watch uh, even if one viewer watches uh, I think uh, it, I scored that as a success for me uh, the YouTube algorithm might not find it successful but I, I do uh, if I reached out to anybody and, and anyone uh, got a benefit from this video uh, I I consider that to be great so Thank you one and all, and uh, I did get feedback about shortening my intro, and I'll try to do that in a good fashion so you get to the meat of the uh, video right away. Take care and have a great weekend, everyone.